Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. Thailand, a country where two-thirds of the jungle is still unexplored. Here, death reigns. They didn't know what kind of animal he was. They'd never seen a white man before. And he had never seen such brutality. You murderers! Murderers! I'm a human being like you! I'm a man, not a fish! Help me to find a canoe. No, along the river. Kukuru tribe live there. Cannibal tribe. And welcome back. So you just heard the trailer for this number 12 in the 88 Films Italian Collection series. This is The Man from Deep River, aka Deep River Savages, aka Savage, um, aka Mondo Cannibal, uh, aka loads of other names. Just tons and tons and tons of names for this movie. Um, let's jump over to the 88 Films website so we can give you the blurb as we like to do on these episodes. It says, so shocking that to this day the British censors insist on culling some of the film's use of live animal performers. The man from Deep River instigated the entire Italian cannibal movie trend. Indeed, long before Cannibal Holocaust attempted to blend its bloodshed and authority upsetting horror, the man from Deep River was carving out an influential and important path of its own. Directed by Umberto Lenzi, who later saw the arterial gushing gore of cannibal ferox and eaten alive, the man from Deep River introduces us to a British expat essayed by genre vet veteran Ivan Razumov, who gets into some bar brawling trouble in Bangkok and flees to the Burmese border. Unfortunately, once there, he is captured by a primitive tribe who do not take kindly to trespassers. On the plus side, though, he, at least he has the lovely tribe babe Mimi Lee from Last Cannibal World to keep him company. But will their forbidden love meet with further flesh filling fear? That's a lovely use of alliteration. Uh, filled with sickle splatter sequences of torture and terror, The Man from Deep River was an original UK video nasty and it returns to British shelves in sanguine splashed HD for a very special 88 films edition. Um, what, what is featured on this, uh, according to the website, is a brand new HD master, which is an uncompressed English soundtrack, an uncompressed Italian soundtrack with newly translated English subtitles, uh, Mimi Lee Bites Back, featuring a documentary about how Cal Model brought the reclusive star back onto the scene, Deep River Discussion, which is an interview with Umberto Lindsay, a Q&A with Rogero Diodato and star Mimi Lee, audio commentary by Cannibal Dr. Callum Waddle, trailer and a reversible sleeve with alternative UK nasty art. Um, yeah, 
So this one has a bit more in terms of the special features that some of the 88 films Italian collection have thus far. I think that's mostly down to the fact that Callum Waddle, and we've spoken about him at kind of length before, um, he is a Scotsman so he gets much props from myself, but um, he has a real affinity with not only this neck of the woods, uh, particularly Asian cinema as well as Italian cinema, but has a real passion for it and knows a lot of people in the business just through his work through 88 Films as well as Arrow, uh, video where he was many, many moons ago. So I, I feel that this is a passion project from him and you can tell that where some of the titles have come out before and they've been a bit lax on special features, there's a bit more happening here. Um, the interview with Umberto Lenzi is kind of fascinating. I think Lenzi is a, a very, very strange and at times very polarising figure in horror. I think he straddles a weird balance between people that consider him nothing but a hack and a guy who genuinely at times showed flashes of ingenuity and um, a particular flair that was then replicated many, many times over by other people in the in the, the movie making biz um, you'll have to look at um, specific styles and then see how they translate to someone like uh, Eli Roth or even to an extent Quentin Tarantino who both consider Lindsay a bit of a god um, as well as you know R Ruggiero Diodato but I think as well, I think at times when you see a movie like this and you hear that this is the movie that kind of set the the ball rolling for the cannibal subgenre in Italy, which became heavily oversaturated really fucking fast, um, I think at that level when you have a passion to delve into that like Callum does, um, it shows through on the special features on this disc. So yeah, enough fluffing. Uh, 88 films up here. Let's um, let's take a second to discuss what the movie is actually about. So like it said in the 88 films blurb, uh, the story sees our, our British expat, John Bradley, a, a photographer played by Ivan Razumov, um, who is currently on assignment, so to speak, in the Thai rainforest. He's over there to, you know, take some photographs, um, taking the sights of Bangkok itself, and what I kind of love about this, um, and this is, I'll be honest and upfront, this is not a movie that I think overall is actually a great movie, but there are things in here which kind of almost make it a bit heavier than your standard cannibal genre fare. Um, what this movie does really well is kind of juxtaposes the, the idea of violence as seen as entertainment by, you know, civilised, quote-unquote civilised uh, humans, um, to how very similar savagery in a kind of more primal setting amongst tribes people uh, could be viewed differently, could be used as very savage, whereas, you know, given a, a sheen, a ring, and a lot of cheering people, all of a sudden it becomes entertainment. So it's worth, it's worth just kind of taking a second to acknowledge that, but he's, you know, he's in Bangkok, he's taking in the sights, the sounds, he goes uh, on a date uh, to a boxing match. The date that he goes with really isn't into this scene at all and uh, Bradley isn't really picking up the the hint that she wants to go somewhere else and as he's not paying much attention to her, I'm just going to say this is not a great date, um, she leaves. Um, but what we get is this man that sees this woman leave who maybe knows her, it's never really explained all that well but he somehow takes offence to the fact that Bradley has besmirched her honour, so to speak, by ignoring her in a fight, and um, confronts him with, with a knife, and the two of them have this kind of, this battle, and, you know, the skirmish, a little, a little bit of a throwdown, and in the kind of struggle, Bradley manages to get a hold of the knife and kills the man, and obviously, straight away, he thinks, oh shit, I'm in a foreign country, and I've just murdered a man, I need to escape, so that's what he does. He decides to flee um, as quick as possible and makes his way deeper into the rainforest. Unfortunately, uh, he gets captured by some some uh, tribesmen who are a bit confused at first. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny because he's wearing a wetsuit and the tribespeople think he's a giant fish. Um, kind of weird scene. 
but he's you know they they bring him back and he convinces them that well actually he is uh you know he is a human too just like them just different colored skin um and he's hung up in this this kind of net um like you would expect like giant fish to be done but he's, he's a prisoner so to speak and he's held up there and it kind of sees the this is the violence we were talking about earlier on um two kind of prisoners of war from another tribe over by uh, are captured and um they have their tongues cut off uh, <laughs> and um Bradley is, you know, appalled by this, even though he's watching two men beat each other practically to death in Bangkok. This is this appalls him. And yeah, he's uh, he eventually manages to kind of convince the tribe that he is not a giant fish, he is indeed a human. And they let him out and get him to do kind of slave labour for them. And of course, Bradley's just trying to earn their trust to the point that he can escape, which he eventually manages to try and do. He makes a run for it, and he is um, he is kind of caught out by the heir to the, the 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 chieftainship of the the tribe. So the chief's daughter is uh, kind of scheduled to marry this guy who stops Bradley, and Bradley takes him out, kills him, and instead of the tribe being you know, mortified by this and upset, the fact that he's managed to do what he has done to this guy has fought fairly, so to speak. Um, they they put him through a lot of different trials, the sort of trials they would put any warrior through to convert him from just an ordinary man to a warrior. And Bradley kind of passes with flying, flying colours, um, so much so that he kind of starts to fall in love with the chief's daughter. Which, you know, to some people is a great thing, to other people ain't so much because there's this guy who's not part of the tribe, who's come from outside, who's got a different coloured skin, who's wooing the, the kind of chief's daughter, and that ain't cool. Of course, all this culminates in um, the, the choice of the, the chief's daughter, uh, Mararia, I think that's how you pronounce that, probably isn't, but she's played by Mimi Lai. Um, she chooses John as her lover. And the two of them get married. They obviously, once they're married, they go to conceive the marriage. Um, and as they're out there doing a bit of the bow chicka wow wow, um, a black butterfly flies by. And this, apparently, to the tribespeople, will uh, be like a, a sign of foreboding doom. So, yeah, it's considered kind of ill fated if a black butterfly is seen in the presence of or kind of there or whatever. Um, so then we jump ahead, it's about six months-ish since um, John was captured by the tribe and he's went from being kind of mistakenly seen as a giant fish to a slave and now to the, you know, the actual heir to the throne of the tribe and everything seems to be going well, he's now fully incorporated himself with the tribe, he's a you know, with their customs, understands what he originally seen as savagery as now being something which is is kind of tradition um, to the tribe. Uh, but remember those war criminals earlier on, those two cannibals that uh, they captured from a, a, another tribe. Well, it's time to it's time to strike down, and that's what happens. The the attack, um, and we get like an ambush just outside the village. Um, and uh, a girl is uh, is murdered from the tribe. A, a boy is pretty much on death's door. He, he manages to tell the tribe that you know it's the it's the the other tribe that has attacked. And um, at this point, we see kind of John working with the you know the kind of attack party, so to speak. Um, and as they arrive, they see that this girl is being consumed. Um, John starts to help attack the warring tribe, kind of signifying his full his full acceptance of his new way of life, his new family, etc. And when he returns back to the tribe, he finds that his his wife has went into labour, but there are complications which have made her blind. Um, 
John decides that really the only best way, the best course of action is not to let the witch doctor treat her, um, but to take her back to Western medicine. That's the only way they can do things. So he tries to smuggle her out, which is a big mistake because she's caught and punished pretty badly. They chop her hands off uh, as punishment for trying to escape. And at this point, um, as they're being brought back, the warring tribe attack their village and start burning down all the huts. John manages to get his wife to safety and, you know, tries to tries to basically comfort her in our, in our last moments. He notices that there's another black butterfly and his wife tells him that it's not just a foreboding situation of doom, impending doom, the black butterfly actually signifies death to the tribe. Um, she gives birth but dies. And uh, John is kind of distraught and, and, and ruined as a man. He's lost the love of his life. Uh, really, really trying to... He's actually wallowing in the memories that he has of her. Um, a helicopter flies by. And we've seen this a few times, a helicopter's flown, flown by. And at first, John may have thought he'd been leaving. But, he, you know, he never did. He kind of didn't have the opportunity to. And this time, he has a chance to wave at the helicopter and get a chance to leave. And as he's thinking about it, he decides to stay. Um, and kind of rejoin the tribe, help them build their village back up again and uh, try and uh, survive against the warring tribe and exact revenge. And that's where the story finishes. It's probably worth saying that the story, like I say, is far more heavier than you would get from a lot of the ones in the in the kind of cannibal genre. And we are going to touch on quite a few of them because 88 films are put out a lot. In fact, I think maybe the next title might be another cannibal one, or there's one within two or three. We'll find out after the break uh, when I announce what the next one is. But, I mean, Lindsay gives this one... It's really, really weird if we're talking about it. In a lot of respects, this movie owes more than just a little nod of the cap to a man called Horse. Um, is basically ripping that off senseless in this one because obviously in A Man Called Horse uh, our central character is captured by Native Americans and then becomes part of the tribe in this one our protagonist so to speak is captured by cannibal tradespeople and brought into the tribe so it's basically the same sort of story um, there are elements in this that start to push it certainly towards the more exploitative pieces of cinema it's nowhere near as gratuitous as uh, some of the movies that it would inspire and certainly follow although there are a couple of bits of gore that Lindsay seems to really get behind there's a kind of hangover from the kind of spaghetti western era style of filmmaking here um, there's a lot of very quick zooms in and out uh, which Lindsay obviously is kind of famous for but you know they come specifically from your spaghetti western genre cinema um, and they're, they're incorporated really well in here if you were doing a drinking game for quick zooms you'd be dead by the end of this movie because there's a ton of them and so in, in a lot of respects is a lot less dumb <laughs> and I don't know why I'm, I'm you know why I would expect it to be dumb but it's a lot less dumb than a movie like Ferox for example uh, this one that has a bit behind it and as a result the exploitative nature of it's kind of held back on it as well it's not really going for the sort of build up we get towards cannibal holocaust and certainly post holocaust we, we don't get that here at all it's, it's still kind of playing fair and true to kind of early 70s uh, Italian genre fair and I think that works really well for it I just find the movie is very long um, and I, because it's kind of the predecessor to a lot of movies that start to twist things and ramp them up to 11 in a lot of respects this could be seen as being a bit more dull especially when you look at how Lindsay revisits this We Eaten Alive and Ferox you know, these are movies that go the exact other way. They, like, really lean heavily into the cannibalism and the the gratuitous violence on the screen. Where this one doesn't, it's peppered through here and there is a slight bit of social commentary which should elevate it. I think it's shot nice enough. I think overall the length of it brings it down for me. There's not enough really going on at any time to pull me in. Um, and the action set pieces are too far away from each other and um, so there's a lot of downtime in this movie a lot of them trying to incorporate with the tribe and yet whilst i understand it adds 
the headier qualities we want is maybe not the sort of stuff I'm looking for in a movie like this. It's not as bad as I remember it being. I did this for the Doing the Nasty podcast with my buddy Andy Blockley about three years ago now we covered this movie and it was a kind of first time watch for me back then and I remember not liking it that much at all having revisited it I think it holds up a whole lot better I think the print from 88 films is great I think they've really done good work on this one and the audio commentary with Cal Model which I did check out is really fascinating because he he knows his shit he really knows his shit so you get a chance to hear him kind of get more involved with with the aspects um, and the stories behind the movie itself. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a weird one. I, I, I would love to say that I would love to go longer and uh, review it, but there really isn't that much to say. It's... I think it was unfairly put on the video nasties list. I can kind of see why it's, you know... Holocaust was such... Such an imposing figure on that list that pretty much anything that could be seen as a predecessor or any any movie that could be seen as within the same sort of cannibal environment was banned straight away. And anything with cannibal in the title was pretty much done. If you listen back to that, there's a couple of there's a couple of movies in there which are so tepid on the cannibalism that were out outright banned because the British censors were were having a hairy fit about it. So yeah, it's. It's not a great movie, it's not a terrible movie, it's nowhere near as exploitative as Lindsay gets. Um, it's a competently made, well shot movie, which is shot in a really nice um, part of the world. The, the, the people in this movie kind of know what movie it is and are playing accordingly. Uh, Ivan Razumov is always a joy to see on screen and he's, he's certainly not tweeing up the, the, the scenery here, he's, he's getting involved with it. Like I say, if you've seen A Man Called Horse, you've kind of seen this movie already, and I would argue A Man Called Horse did it better. But, in the grand scheme of things, this movie is nowhere near as bad as I remember it being. As grades go, I would actually give this a 3 out of 5. I liked it this time. I thought it, it was decent. And that surprises me to say, because I've been kind of giving it a hard time on the build-up to this, that I was going to kind of come down a bit heavier on it, but watching it this time, I think a three sits it well. I didn't dislike my watch of it this time, I actually thought it was pretty good. So yeah, three out of five for this movie.